Apparently, in the United States, over 600,000 people go missing every year. That is an awful lot of people. Whilst many of these people are found alive, unfortunately, others are not, and some just go missing and are never seen again. But what about families? How on earth do families go missing? The following are two families who disappeared in unusual circumstances. Martin family, Oregon. On December the 7th, 1958, Kenneth and Barbara Martin left the home with their three daughters, Barbie 14, Virginia 13, and Susan 11, in their 1954 cream and red Ford station wagon. At the time, the eldest son, Donald, 28, was in the Navy and was stationed in New York. The family were intending to drive to the Columbia River Gorge to pick some greenery to use for Christmas decorations. It is uncertain whether they actually reached the gorge, but sometime between leaving their house and driving to the gorge, they disappeared. The first anyone had suspicions of their disappearance was on December the 9th, when Kenneth failed to turn up for work at Echo's Electric Home Service Company. His wife Barbie failed to attend her morning classes at Grant High School and Susan and Virginia did not turn up for class at Rose City School. That evening, Kenneth and his boss, Taylor Eccles, became concerned and went to the police. Police then visited their property at 11pm in the hope of finding any clues to where they could have gone. On entering the house, they found nothing out of the ordinary and nothing had been disturbed. The police now had the task of retracing the family's movements. A gas station proprietor called Dean Baxter reported seeing the family after they purchased gas from the station in Cascade Locks at around 4pm, which must have been their first stop after leaving Portland. He said their car then headed east after they left the store. The family was then spotted at a snack bar in Hood River where a waitress named Clara York stated she served the family. They were also sighted around dusk near Columbia River in Washington State where witnesses were able to describe the clothing they were wearing. The first possible lead was when a stolen car was located in Cascade Locks, which was approximately a two-hour drive south from Columbia Gorge. They initially thought it could have been the Martin's car, but was immediately dismissed as it was the wrong model and colour. However, they did find a handgun close to the vehicle that had been thrown in the bushes and was covered in blood. After checking the serial number, they trace it to a Amir and Frank department store. To add confusion to the case, the gun had subsequently been found to be among several sporting good items that their son Donald had been accused of stealing whilst working at Amir and Frank two years earlier. The abandoned car was traced to two ex-cons, who were duly arrested in Hood River County, 18 miles away, and were charged with car theft. In a further twist of the case, Hood River was one of the last places that the Martin family had been seen. A waiter told law enforcement that the two convicts were in the restaurant at the same time as the Martins and the two men left at the same time as the Martins. Searches were undertaken by both county police but neither were able to produce substantial leads. By December the 8th, police had received numerous letters and phone calls where one of them proved fruitful when an orchard owner east of Portland claimed that around December the 7th he witnessed the man and woman gathering plants. He then added that the following week he observed a flock of buzzards flying around in the same location. But after a thorough police search, they found nothing. Then, on December the 28th, they located a woman's glove close to where the stolen Chevrolet had been found. The police were unable to prove it belonged to Barbara Martin. Over the following days, other sightings reported seeing their car speeding on Bulldog Freeway, while others claimed they saw them in Burlington, Iowa. On January the 7th, 1959, a truck driver has seen a car with Oregon's license plates matching their car's description in Billings, Montana. By February 1959, investigators searched various locations from the Portland region to Mount Hood. More clues were found when a volunteer searcher found tire tracks matching their car which appeared to have driven off of a cliff near the Dalles in Oregon. Paint chips were recovered at the location and sent to the FBI for analysis and they came back positive. Judging by the tire marks and paint, the investigators believed their vehicle had somehow plunged into the river. Army Corps of Engineers were then called in, where they lowered the level of the river by 5 feet and searched the area using sonar technology, but with no luck. 
On the 1st of May 1959, a river drilling rig near the Dalles claimed to have hooked something extremely heavy, but it broke away before it could be pulled to the surface, and there is no explanation as to why they did not further pursue this or whether they failed to locate it. Unfortunately, on May the 2nd, the first piece of gruesome evidence was found when a fisherman and his wife reported seeing two bodies floating downstream near Cascade Locks. The bodies were again seen near Bonneville Dam. On May the 3rd, the body of Susan was picked up in Columbia River, near Camus, Washington, 70 miles west of the Dalles. Then on May the 4th, Virginia's body was found near Bonneville Dam, 46 miles west of the Dalles. The coroners claim they both drowned. It appears that the drilling rig could have dislodged the car, possibly releasing the bodies from the vehicle where they floated upstream. Further sonar was used to scale the lake, but to no avail. Police figured that the family had perished when the car drove into the lake. The Multnomah County Police suspected foul play, as there was evidence proving that they were possibly forced into the lake. Police were unable to determine whether the two ex-cons were involved in their disappearance, but Walter Graven, a Portland detective, felt certain that the family had met with foul play and the case could only be solved when they located the missing car. To this day, the remains of Kenneth, Barbara and Barbie remain undiscovered and the vehicle has never been found. And maybe one day if the river runs dry and exposes a vehicle, or a storm surge hits the river, dislodging the vehicle, we may never know the truth. The family's disappearance was one of the most baffling mysteries in Oregon history, and sparked the largest manhunt at the time. Solomon Family, California In 1982, 35-year-old Sol Solomon, a former Israeli commando, lived in Northridge, California, with his 39-year-old wife Elaine, their 9-year-old son Mitchell, and Elaine's 15-year-old daughter Michelle from a previous marriage. Sol owned a business that repaired and refilled fire extinguishers. At around 6pm on October 12, 1982, Sol left the house with business associate Harvey Rader to attend a car auction. That same day, Elaine's parents visited the home and left at around 10.30pm. About 11.30pm, Elaine was having a phone conversation with a friend when the doorbell rang. Elaine then told her friend that she had to win the call because Harvey was at the door. That phone call was the last time that anyone had heard from the family. The police were later notified when friends were concerned that they had not heard from the family. When police arrived at the house, they found that Mercedes was not there and their two other vehicles, a Rolls Royce and the business car, were still parked outside. On entering the house, the police immediately became suspicious when they discovered splatters of blood on the mattress and wall. The bed was broken and all of the bedclothes were missing and a section of carpet had been torn away. Further suggestions of foul play emerged when on October the 17th, the family's passports, wallets and photos were discovered on the side of the road on the Antelope Valley Freeway outside the town of Acton. Police immediately placed Harvey Rader at the top of their list as a possible suspect as he was the person that Sol was planning to meet and Sol's wife had mentioned his name on the phone to a friend. Police also discovered that Rader was a British citizen who had an extensive criminal history. Harvey Rader owned a car dealership and Sol had invested $20,000 in that business. To add further fuel to the fire, the Solomon's Mercedes was found at Rader's garage. When the police interviewed Rader, he confirmed that they had driven to a car auction at Sol's work car on the evening of October the 12th, and after the auction, Sol wished to be dropped off at an Israeli restaurant. After dropping Sol off, Rader claimed that at 10.30pm he had driven Sol's work car back to the house. Then had rung the doorbell and returned the keys to his wife, who in turn handed him the keys of the Mercedes, which had needed some repairs, which he then took to his garage. Rader vehemently denied that he was involved in their disappearance and suggested another reason was that he was involved with the Israeli Mafia. He also claimed that Sol's lifestyle far exceeded what he earned in his fire extinguisher business. However, Rader was still the number one suspect as there were inconsistencies in his story. Firstly, the car auction had actually ended at 5pm, whereas Sol did not leave the house until 6pm. Secondly, the Israeli restaurant was not open that night. Events took another turn when in November 1983, Raider's cousin Ashley Paul claimed that he had seen Raider take Sol's life after Sol had demanded his $20,000 back. 
Paul had apparently worked for Raider, but then returned to England after the family had gone missing. The only reason Paul had come forward was because Elaine's family had contacted a private investigator who was able to track him down and force him to talk to the police in exchange for immunity from prosecution. Paul then returned to the States where he gave investigators his official version of the attack on Seoul. Paul then added to his story claiming that another car dealer called Gerald Baxter and two Italian men were heavily involved in the family's disappearance. Paul then claimed that he'd helped Raider bury the family in the desert in Antelope Valley. Paul then implicated Raider in the disappearance of a British couple named Peter and Joan Davis who went missing on March the 17th, 1982. At the time of the disappearance, the Davis family lived only two miles from the Solomons and also had business dealings with Raider. Paul claimed that Raider had taken their lives in order to steal valuable artwork from their home and he also helped bury that family in the desert near Bakersfield. Raider also told Paul that he was also responsible for the disappearance of yet another Burbank businessman called Ronald Adib who also had financial dealings with Raider. Yet, when Paul led the authorities to the location of the missing families, they found nothing. Police then arrested Raider and Baxter for the disappearance of the Solomon family, but were later released due to lack of evidence. Police found Paul to be totally unreliable when he admitted to them that Baxter was not involved and the Italians had never existed. Paul had in turn incriminated himself and was charged with the disappearance of the Solomon and Davis family. However, to add more confusion to the story, a judge was forced to dismiss any charges against Paul, where he then returned to England. However, Raider did go on to serve time in prison, but for passport fraud, and after leaving prison in September 1988, he was about to be deported when the authorities arrested him for the disappearance of the Solomon family. This time, Paul refused to return to the States to testify, and without any physical evidence, his case was purely circumstantial. During Raider's trial, his defense team claimed that Sol lost his life due to his activities with the Israeli Mafia. Finally, the jury voted 11 to 1 in favor of convicting Raider, but could not reach a unanimous verdict, and they declared a mistrial. Another hearing was held in May 1992, but again ended when the juror was convinced that the Salomon family was still alive, after hearing that three witnesses came forward claiming that they'd seen Sol Solomon in the town of Carpinteria in California after October the 12th, the night he supposedly disappeared. The jury then acquitted Raider. The remains of the Solomons and Davis families have never been found. <laughs>